Amen. Well, good morning. Well, I am, uh, I am thrilled to be here today. This is um, an exciting day. There's a lot of, a lot of people here. There's some new faces. There's, there's some people that have returned, and um, we just thank you, Stephen. We just thank you for um, setting aside, you know, part of your week uh, in worship to God. You know, it's, uh, it's super important that we gather together. Uh, we need this. We need to be edified. Uh, there is so much that we can, uh, we can get online, and I, I love the fact that there's so much good truth that's at our fingertips, literally, in our pockets, on our phones, and, and, uh, and of course, we can have our daily devotion, and we can, we can get God downloading right into us, uh, but there's something about gathering together and praising God. So thank you for, for uh, setting aside time this morning, and to those who are watching online as well, um, we are grateful that you're worshiping with us, and I do believe that you can worship with us from your living room. I know my in-laws are in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. It's very cold there right now, and they're worshiping with us this morning. So, um, so we're grateful whether you're gathered in person or online. So this morning, we're going to continue on uh, with what we talked about last week. And, and again, I want us over the next couple weeks to just kind of put ourselves in the framework of, of what's going on as we prepare our hearts for Easter. And we are, um, you know, looking at this, what some call the passion uh, of the Christ. And that is that period. It's either some look at it as it's starting on Palm Sunday and going through uh, the crucifixion and resurrection. Others look at the passion as kind of narrower, and it's just that time period in which Jesus began to suffer, and so that would be in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, but we're looking at those last days and hours before Jesus laid down his life. And so last week, we were, we were really looking at that, that moment or those moments in which Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples, and we're looking at John and, and how John just unpacks Jesus' teachings. And so we, we, we were looking at uh, what we called commands from the Passion, where Jesus, uh, he actually said, I, there's a new command I give you, and that's, that's that you love one another. We, we looked at his example in which he, he as he is serving uh, his disciples, he's literally humbling himself by washing their feet. And then he, he gives us them, them this object lesson, and he's like, hey, this is, this is what it's all about. You have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. And, and, and there's this commandment I give you that you love one another. And we talked about what that looks like and how that can practically play out in unity among believers and and, and what is some of the fruit of that unity is that actually people believe in Jesus. And so we were looking at that last week. We're going to continue this week. Um, and we're going to look at something else Jesus left with his disciples. Such an important teaching. And not only did he say, you have to humble yourself as my followers. And not only did he say, you have to love one another as my followers. But we see him saying in his teachings, basically he's saying, trust me. Trust me. You know, and I think we as believers, we need to be reminded to trust God. We, we, we need to be reminded. And, and I look at this and I look in scripture and I'm like, you know what, if the disciples who were hanging out with Jesus every single day for around three years, if they kind of need to be reminded to trust Trust Jesus, you know, in those last days and hours. I, I, maybe, maybe perhaps we as Christians who haven't spent the last three years physically in the presence of Jesus might need to occasionally be reminded to trust him. And, and I know that we do. I know, I know that if you've been a follower of Jesus for any amount of time, I know we, we, we do trust God. You know, that's part of this whole walk of following Jesus. You know, you have to have faith, you have to trust in order to even identify with being a follower of Jesus, identify with being a disciple. And yet sometimes I know how 
you know, it, it can inadvertently slip into kind of like, um, you know, Christianese, you know, or like, I got to trust God, or I trust God. You know, it's that, a few weeks ago, we talked about, you know, uh, loving one another and how sometimes we can slip into that, love your brother kind of thing. And, and, and we do, we know as a Christian that we're supposed to love one another. And yet, how does that practically w- walk out in my life? Like, how do I actually put loving my brother into practice? You know, and so we say as Christians, I trust God, I trust God. And yet, I think it's important for us to be reminded of why we trust God. Why we trust God and, and how practically does that literally play out in my life so I'm not one of those Christians that says, oh yeah, I trust God. And then I, then I catch myself like living in a way which might not demonstrate complete trust. And so what I want to do is I want to look at this incredibly powerful, practical teaching that Jesus unpacks for his disciples. And, and we are in, in Luke, and we're going to begin in Luke again. We're going to be in, in chapter 14. We're going to be, if you're tuning in online, we're going to be primarily, keep your Bible open, because we're going to be between Luke 14, 15, and, uh, I'm sorry, I said Luke, John 14, 15, and 16, and uh, that's going to be where we're going to be hanging out and, and also, just as a reminder, last week, I kind of threw out this challenge. John gives about 40% of his gospel to these last few days of Jesus' life. You want to prepare your heart for Easter? Easter's two weeks away from today. Can I just encourage you? Can you, can you meditate on these 10 chapters? John 10 through John 21. Like, like John you know, the first 11 chapters of John, it, you, we see a lot of similarities with some of the other Gospels, and we, we're seeing he's, you know, the, the events in Jesus' life, and then, and it's like, you know, he's kind of flying through some highlights, and then you get to, you get to chapter 12, and it's like, Voo. and it's like the next 10 chapters, like, go in slow motion. It's as if the, as if the writer wants us to know how important these last few hours and days were. And empowered by the Holy Spirit, speaking to us through these words, and we can learn. But again, we want to look at two things this morning. Why should we trust Jesus? And I'm just going to jump right into the practical that you and I, why you and I could trust Jesus. Now, usually when you're looking at scripture, there's a, there's a good way to unpack scripture and research scripture. And, 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 and what you usually do is you look at the historical aspects like the historical truth, like what was going on? Why is that relevant? Well, it is relevant because if you don't completely understand the historical things that were playing out, you, you might miss, misapply the truth. So it's super important that we understand the historical context because if we don't, uh, then we might walk away with an understanding that it's actually a sin for women to braid their hair. Because you know the Apostle Paul said that, right? So does that really mean that women shouldn't braid their hair? No, there's a historical component. There's something going on that Paul is specifically speaking into. And so it's super important that we understand the historical narrative. And from that, we, we, we pull out what's the always true component. What's the always true component? Because Paul wasn't talking about hairstyles which is a good thing because I, I think historians think he was bald, um, but, uh, but Paul is actually talking about pride and how we view other people, but you don't get that unless you dive into the historical. So you dive into the historical and then you pull the always true component out and then you dive into the practical and that's like, okay, how do I apply what Paul was saying to your, your life and to my life? But I'm going to skip the historical and the always true component because Jesus gave us permission to apply this teaching directly to our life. Because he says in John 17, he's praying this, it's called the priestly prayer, and he's praying to God and he's saying, I'm praying for these. He's, he's unpacking this teaching and he's praying for them. He's praying for their understanding. He's praying for their strength. He's praying for their spiritual maturity. And then he says, and I'm not just, not just for these, the twelve but for everybody that's going to believe in me because of them. 
So basically, whoever became a disciple because of these disciples and then discipled somebody who discipled somebody who discipled somebody in truth and the gospel went all throughout the world and thousands of years later, you and I are some of these that Jesus is talking about. So we can just look right at what Jesus is saying to the disciples and we can say, okay, I can immediately start applying this to my life right here, right now. So let's look at the first thing. Why... And I know this is a little bit basic and a little bit elementary maybe, and so just bear with me because, again, sometimes we need to be reminded of why we trust. Well, the first reason that we, we trust Jesus when he just says, trust me, is because our future is secure. Bottom line, your future is secure. You can count on that as a follower of Jesus, and we see this in his teachings in, in chapter 14, uh, in verse 1, it says, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, told, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. He's talking about eternal life. That where I am, you may be also and you know the way where I'm going, to go where I'm going. He's, he's saying, and he gets ready to unpack, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have heard Jesus say, you want to get to the Father, you come through me. I invite you into relationship, and you believe in me, you place your faith in me. I am the Messiah, I am the anointed one, I am the prophesied savior that that you have been reading about i'm him and you know that through me you have eternal life so the first thing is like we can trust god because ultimately my future is secure my eternal future is secure so we can trust in him we also see this in john 14 if we if we jump down into verses 27 and 28 i love how it puts it here verse 27 Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let your, not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I will come to you. So Jesus is promising right, right up front, like your future is secure. Like I'm going away, I'm coming back, I'm going away to prepare a place in my father's house, he's referring to heaven. I've got a place for you. Your eternal future is secure. So one of the reasons that we can trust God, and we know this as Christians, but sometimes we need to be reminded, our future is secure. Our eternal future is secure no matter what we're seeing in front of us. No matter what's playing out in our life. Karen and I have uh, some, some dear friends um, from the church I was at before in, in Los Angeles. And just a few weeks ago, uh, because of a series of events, it, he was actually having a pain in his shoulder and he thought, you know, he maybe did something to his shoulder. He goes to the doctor. And it's kind of one of those weird things where you go to the doctor because you think something. And because of that, they actually discovered that he's got cancer. He would have never known had it not been for the pain in his shoulder, which actually... Somehow, I don't even know how that was related. But here's, here's the deal. They are facing a very difficult situation. But our friend knows his future is secure. No matter what plays out in his life right now, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, in the coming years, he knows that he knows that he knows he's going to be with Jesus. Jesus. And so there's this sense that, number one, I can trust Jesus, uh, I can trust God, ultimately, because regardless of what happens today, tomorrow, next year, I, I know where I'm going. And, and we as believers, we need, to, we, we need to live in the right here and now, but we also need to leave, live with a perspective of the future. And it's like, we got to be reminded, like, no matter how bad it gets, my, my, my future is secure. My future is secure, so that's why we, we trust in Jesus. We also trust in Jesus because Jesus says, hey, you're not going to be alone. 
in this life, you're not going to be alone. Now, he's telling his disciples who he's physically been with for the past three years or so, and, and, and they're about to be separated from him, and he's like, you know what? I, I want you to trust me. I want you to stay strong. You're not going to see me physically, but I want you to trust me because you're not going to be alone. God is going to be with you. We see this in John 14, 16, and 18. And it says this in verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Do you notice that it's capitalized there? To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you at or as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. Now, I, I love this. You know how the different gospels, they all have different, like, nuances and and such you know so luke was a historian and he was a physician he was really detail oriented and 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 all of that and mark was just like just brief and to the point he was like a fiery preacher it's like this happened and then this and then this you know the word immediately is like dozens and dozens of times in in mark because it's like and immediately jesus did this and immediately you know and they all they have different nuances and matthew is he's a jewish person and and so he's connecting the dots from the old testament prophecies to to people today that are experiencing jesus they all have these really cool nuances and john john might have been a little bit um I, you know my my grandmother was an english teacher and so she was always correcting my grammar. And I just wonder if, if John's grandma was a grammar teacher. Because what's really, really interesting is you study the, the book of John is that John is very, very precise and distinctive about use of grammar, especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Now, you see the word spirit in Greek is, is not personified. It, it's, it's, it refers to, it's like, like spirit is a noun, but it's not a personal noun. It's spirit is like book or stool or microphone. Okay, so when you, when you talk about a stool, you usually say it. Like I moved it. John is very, very precise in his grammar and he does something that is unorthodox and he switches things up where the Greek words actually don't match because he's personifying the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, um, I, Jesus is saying, I'm going to be with you. You're going to be, you won't be alone. God will be with you because I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I'm sending the advocate. I'm sending the helper. And it says, you will know him, not it. You're not going to know the spirit as an it. You will know him, the spirit, for he dwells in you and will be with you. And I'm not going to leave you as orphans. So Jesus is saying, you can trust me because number one, your, your eternal future is secure. Like you got a slot in my father's presence. There is a cool, cool room in my father's house with your name on it. And by the way, before you get to my father's house, um, I'm, you're not going to be alone. You're not going to be an orphan. You're going to be able to experience the presence of God because he will be with you. Now, this had to be a little comforting to the disciples who have literally been in Jesus' presence for three years. Now, last week, we kind of looked at this setting and we looked at the Palm, uh, you know, we, we refer to it as Palm Sunday today, where, where Jesus had this glorious interest in, entrance into Jerusalem and then, and then he withdrew and then they, he sent his disciples, remember we looked at that, he sent his disciples into the city to, to, to find somebody to prepare a place, the upper room for, for the Last Supper, do you remember us talking about that? So, so when he sent those two disciples into the city to find that guy who was carrying water to, to go back to the house and plan out this place that they can have this, this dinner, let me ask you something. Was Jesus with them? Was Jesus with them? You can answer yes or no. No, he wasn't with them. 
Why? Because when Jesus, when it was, when Jesus was God incarnate in human flesh, there was physical limitations that, that God himself allowed himself to take on, and proximity would be one of those. Like Jesus, as, as, as God in dwelling in a physical body, can only be at one place at one time. But Jesus is saying, now, I, physically, I'm going to be gone, but it's actually really good for you that I am. And it, he actually says in John 16, 7, it's actually to their advantage that they go. Look at this, John 16, 7, turn over one page, and it says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. That had to be a little bit of a shocker. The disciples, like, wow, we've been walking around with the Messiah It's actually to my advantage that you go. It's to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go, if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. So we can, we can trust in Jesus. We can trust in God because our eternal future is secure. Because we're not living this life on our own. We've got the Holy Spirit with us. That's a powerful thing. Like, like, I'm very, very excited about next weekend. And, and, and the, the, the three-part series, like, on understanding the Holy Spirit. And what I, you know, I, this is actually set up perfectly to go into next weekend. Because, you know, we often think about, you know, Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. As in, uh, you know, Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to be, you're going to be empowered. You're going to be my witnesses. And, and wait here for the Holy Spirit. And we think about Jesus saying, you know, the Holy Spirit's coming, but did you know Jesus talked a whole lot about the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John? In this unpacking of this beautiful teaching in these last hours that Jesus is with his disciples, he mentions the Holy Spirit over and over and over again. And he's like, you can trust me. You might be nervous in the moment when you don't see me, when I'm not here, but you can trust me. You're not going to be alone. The third reason that we can, we can trust God is, is because the world doesn't win. The world doesn't win. And I love how Jesus unpacks this. Let's look at John 15. Let's look at John 15 in verses, uh, beginning in verse 18. In, in verse 18, it says this, the, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of this world, but because I chose you out of this world, therefore, get this, the world hates you. Wow, that's a real good pep talk. The world's going to hate you. Remember that the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. He's talking about just a few moments before he washed their feet. He's talking about humility, but he's also taking that object lesson and saying, you know, as a master, I'm humbling myself before you. Uh, you know, you, you, you shouldn't try to be something that I'm not. And then he applies that same object lesson to what, the, what they're going to encounter with the world. And he's like, hey, um, if the world hates me, guess what? They're going to hate you. Let's look at, uh, flip over to 16 uh, in, in verses 32. Chapter 16, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered. Again, great pep talk. The world's going to hate you. You're going to be scattered, each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you in that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation. Okay, so, so far, so far we've heard a couple of things. We have heard that um, the world's going to hate them. We've heard that they're going to be scattered. They, they, that there's going to experience tribulation. But it says, look at this, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can trust God because he has won. Guess what? The outcome has been determined. 
So I know we know these things, but it's a good refresher to be reminded of, I can trust in God, I can trust in Jesus, because no matter what happens on this earth, my eternal future is secure. No matter what I experience, I know that I'm not going to go through it alone, because the Holy Spirit is with me. And no matter what happens, no matter what plays out, God wins. The world does not overcome Jesus. Jesus says, I overcome the world. Now, those are the reasons why we can trust him. And you know what I love about this passage? I love, you know, part of building trust is, um, is the fact that Jesus is, is preparing them. Now, that doesn't mean we never have surprises in life, but, but you know what? If Jesus said nothing about the difficulty... Nothing about the tribulation, nothing about the world hating them. If Jesus said nothing about them being scattered and, and going through some, some really, really tough times, uh, but he only said this, hey guys, I've overcome the world, don't worry, I've overcome. If that's all he said, then what can happen when this starts playing out and and, and, and we, in our human nature, we start seeing, like, the world winning. Or we're starting to experience all this adversity. Or, or things are just, like, really, really starting to develop in a really bad way. We're like, what, wait, 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 wait. Was Jesus really right? But Jesus is, he's giving them a heads up. And that's part of the, the faith component here. That's part of the trust component. He's like, look, on the surface, it may look like the kingdom of God is losing ground. It may look like that on the surface. You may feel that. Don't, don't worry. Trust me. Yeah, but God, you, but, but, but you know, the government's doing this and yeah, yeah, but trust me. Yeah, but God, you don't see, like, like the, 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 the Christians, they're, you know, they're, they're being persecuted. Trust me. Yeah, but God, I don't know if you saw this one coming. Trust me. I saw it coming. You know, one of the reasons that we knew that the message sunk in to Jesus' followers is by their behavior later where they literally started playing out, like demonstrating that they trusted what Jesus said. So, so this week, um, Karen and I, had, we had a chance, we got to, we got to uh, hang out with uh, Sandra and Wilson, and we had a great conversation, and, and um, I, I, I remember we, we kind of moved into this category or this co conversation about apologetics, you know, apologetics is basically, you know, the, 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 the theology behind, you know, why the gospel is true, defending the gospel and, and why we can, we can believe it. And, and we were talking a little bit about this and it was neat how Wilson was sharing with me what one of the things that really impacted him was that he, he, he discovered as he, was, as he was learning about the gospel, how many people witnessed the resurrection. It wasn't just like a handful of people, but how many people literally saw the resurrected Christ? You know, and that really impacted him. And you know what? At, when, when they uh, started to, to, to demonstrate that they trusted Jesus, we see it play out in their actions because people were persecuted, people were killed, Historians believe that maybe only one of the, the original 12 disciples died a natural death. Why would somebody put up with that kind of hatred? Why would somebody put up with that kind of torture? Why would somebody put up with that kind of persecution if they didn't believe, if they didn't trust that what Jesus said was true? And Jesus said, I win. I win. Don't be discouraged by what you see play out in front of you because I win. So this, this idea of, of why we trust Jesus is really played out in these few passages, 14, 15, 16 of the Gospel of John. 
So we see we, we, we need to be reminded, just like the disciples, that why we trust God, we trust him because our eternal future is secure. We trust him because we don't live this life alone. We have the Holy Spirit in us. I'm excited for us next week to learn more about what that looks like. And, and God wins. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. So those are the reasons why you and I trust. How does that play out in a practical sense? Like, how does that play out? You're like, I get that, Greg. Okay, yes, I trust God. I've trusted God all my life, or I've been a Christian for a year. I've been trusting him for a year. But literally, like, how does that play out? Because sometimes you and I live our life in such a way that sometimes um, when the rubber meets the road, it, makes, it gets a little difficult. Am I the only one? Where, where, where you're like, okay, I trust, but oh. I'm a little nervous. Have you ever kind of been in that weird situation where I like, I trust God and I'm freaked out at the same time? So how? How do we live this out of trusting God? Well, there's a couple of things that we want to do. And that's, that's, let's look back. We looked at it a minute ago, but let's look in John 14. Let's look in verse 1. I want to reread verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled... Believe in God, believe also in me. Jump down to verse 10. Verse 10 says this. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. By the way, this is a really good picture of John's unpacking a little bit of the theology of the Trinity here. This is really cool, where he's talking about the Father being in him, and he's talking about he's leaving so the help of the Holy Spirit can come. So it's beautiful, it's beautiful. But get, catch this, uh, again, in verse 10, do you not believe? Then, then look in verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. So listen, in, in this, these verses, did you catch a theme? In, in four verses, the word believe is, is listed six times. Six times. So from a practical standpoint, Jesus is unpacking this truth to his disciples. You're like, hey, trust me. And, and how do you and I demonstrate trust? How do we exercise this muscle? How, how do I trust God on Monday, on Tuesday? How do I trust God with a diagnosis that's not a great diagnosis? How do I trust God when my son or my daughter is drifting away from the faith? How do I trust God when I just lost my job? How do I, how do, how do I trust God? One of the things that you and I can do just in a practical, practical sense, believe what God says. Now that is something that you actually have complete control over. Did you know believing is a choice? Now, am I going to believe the words of God? Am I going to believe what Jesus said? Am I going to believe what the Holy Spirit said through the other writers in, in, in the Bible? Am I going to believe it? Am I going to go to the bank on it or not? You want to demonstrate that you trust God. It starts with just simply believing what God says. Simple as that. I have printed out some of these and... I'll be happy to give anybody after service who, who wants some of these. You know, here's the catch about believing what Jesus said. Here's the catch about believing what the Bible says. You can't believe it if you don't know it. So can I just encourage you, get the words of God in you. Get it in you. Did you know, there's some amazing things. Did you know that you're called a child of God? 
In 1 John 3, it says, see the, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Do you believe that you're a child of God? Did you know that you're a child of God? Hey, put this into practice. I believe I'm a child of God. What, 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 what does that mean? That means that God is going to take care of me. God's going to nurture me. God's got my back. Did you know that you're free? You have freedom in Christ in Galatians 5. Did you know you're whole in Christ? We are whole. We are made whole in Christ. The emptiness, the inadequacy that we have individually, that is made whole in Christ. We see that in Colossians 2 and verses 10. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. That means no matter what you've done, no matter what's in the past, You've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified, not because of you earned it, but because of Christ's blood. You know, see, there's a lot of amazing things in Scripture. We need to start believing. That's how you and I demonstrate trust. Just believe. I'm going to choose to believe it. If God says it's so, I'm going to believe it. If God says all things work together for good for those that are in Christ, I'm going to believe it. And even though I have this diagnosis, or even though I lost my job, or even though I have this difficult relationship... I'm going to trust that God is working in it somehow because God is a good God and his word says that. His word tells me that I am loved. This, his word gives me promises and I'm just going to believe it. So that's how on Monday I demonstrate my trust. I just choose to believe. We also need to listen and learn from the Holy Spirit. That's another way. So Jesus said, hey, I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to, I'm going to, you're not going to be alone. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan, but I'm going to help you. You're not going to live this life alone. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. But what does that mean? Like, like if, if the Holy Spirit is with me, if the Holy Spirit is my helper, if the Holy Spirit is right there with me and I'm not alone, how silly would I be to not tap into that? How silly would I be to not, like, get some advice, get some direction, get some help, get some encouragement. And we see that. Look at, look at John 14 and verse 26. John 14 and verse 26. I love this. Uh, we're going to actually start in, um, yeah, verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. He will teach you. Guess what? Jesus is not physically right here in front of you, but you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's a promise. And one way that you can trust that, that, that God has got your back is to listen to the Holy Spirit who Jesus said, he will teach you. He will teach you. He will bring things to your remembrance. Have you ever been in a situation where... Um, uh, you're, you're talking to somebody and, and, you know, a scripture comes to your mind, but you can't remember exactly where it is, but you know that there's a biblical truth and, and, and you just bring it up. You're like, hey, I don't, I don't know exactly where it says this, but I want to just tell you, it says in the Bible that fill in the blank. That's the Holy Spirit bringing back to your remembrance that truth which has been deposited in you. You know, and you get to take the Holy Spirit with you. You get to take the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus, when he sent those two disciples on an errand, hey, go in Jerusalem and find, out a, find a place for us to eat. He wasn't physically with them. But after he left, they had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with them everywhere. That means the Holy Spirit goes to the store with you. You have the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. We need to listen and learn from the Holy Spirit. That's how I demonstrate trust. I demonstrate trust when I just take God at his word. Jesus said it, so it must be true. I'm not going to be guided and, and make a determination or a judgment based on my circumstances, based on what I see right in front of me. I'm just going to take it to the bank. Jesus said it, it's true. And by the way, I, I'm not alone in this situation. I may feel like I'm alone in this situation. I, don't, I may feel like there's nobody who understands what I'm going through, but that's not true. The Holy Spirit is with me. He says, Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit will teach you. I love this. Look at John 16, verses 13 through 15. John 16, verses 13 through 15. It says, 
when the spirit of truth comes, he, again, John was very precise about pronouns, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare it to you, the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is mine, therefore I said, he will take what is mine and declare it. Are you hearing this? That the, the Holy Spirit will teach you, the Holy Spirit will guide you, the Holy Spirit will declare, 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 declare. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is with you. You can trust that. And the Holy Spirit is guiding, he's teaching, and he's speaking to you. You want to start walking in this trust where you're like trusting God Monday through Saturday, maybe even on Sunday morning in that stressful period right before church? Invite the Holy Spirit who's already with you to start shaping your thinking, declaring to you what is true, giving you wisdom, guiding you, directing you. In a couple weeks, we're going to be in that Romans 8 sermon series, and, and you're going to see in Romans 8 where, where the Holy Spirit says, uh, where, where Paul says the Holy Spirit will lead you. So here in John, we're seeing the Holy Spirit teaches you, the Holy Spirit guides you, he declares things to you, We'll see in Romans that he leads you. We also see that in Galatians. You're not in this alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. Finally, so again, this is the how-to. How do we trust? We, we, we trust by believing God. We just take him at his word. We, we, we listen and learn from the Holy Spirit. Can I, just, can I just encourage you to start training your heart to hear from God. See, if we believe that first truth, which is Jesus says, believe, 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 believe. He's trying to hammer it into his disciples. Believe me. Do you believe me? I need you to believe me. Did I, did I tell you that you need to believe me? Over and over again. So if we get that first step down where we believe what Jesus is saying, then we're going to believe Jesus when he says the Holy Spirit will help you out. Are we training our ears to hear from the Holy Spirit? Are we quieting our spirit so that we can hear from his spirit? Are we softening our hearts so that we can learn? Let's pay attention to what we're listening to and what we're putting in our heart. That's how we can practically walk out this life of trusting Jesus. Finally, I'm going to go back to chapter 16 and verse 33. We read this a minute ago. The final step, like where you and I, the rubber meets the road on demonstrating trust, is we got to just simply recognize that the victory has already been won. Now, I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come back up here. Um, what are you dwelling on? Are, are, you, are you dwelling on the news? Are you dwelling on your circumstances? You know, remember, Jesus was telling his disciples, you're going to suffer. There actually is going to be persecution. Now, I, I don't know about you, but... Uh, we have enjoyed, like, I, I feel like we as the, as believers in the United States for many, many years have really enjoyed a season. I'm not saying it's been easy to be a Christian, but I don't know that we've really experienced outright persecution like some areas of the world. Like in the Middle East or in China or, or the underground church. By the way, the underground church thrived during the first persecution. Do you know that the gospel advanced big time through persecution in the underground church? Now, I think it's, it's important for us to realize that, you know what? There's, there's a a climate that's taking place in the world around us right now that is becoming more and more and more adversarial. 
towards the Christian viewpoint, towards living a lifestyle that's in alignment with this. You know, um, I guess the, the Seuss family pulled uh, seven Dr. Seuss books out of publication because they were, I guess, they're, they're deemed offensive now or insensitive. Uh, Disney Plus. Love to watch The Mandalorian. Uh, but uh, Disney Plus, a couple months ago, they pulled Dumbo and um, Peter Pan. Insensitive. Offensive. I, I know of a, a one author who wrote a book a couple years ago about gender identity, and it wasn't even a political statement or anything like that. He was actually researching like the impact of gender transition in all different segments of society. And, and, and the book's been out for several years. Um, recently learned his book was pulled off of Amazon without them even knowing. They, they, the author was starting to get contacted by people like, is this book out of print? Like we go search for Amazon, that book is not there anymore. They didn't even tell him that this, this book on gender identity and transition uh, is, is now hate speech. And they just simply pulled it. We're living in a world that's becoming more and more adversarial to what is in this book right now. And I wonder, is there ever a time when somebody might think this is offensive? We see in scripture, it says the gospel offends. It's foolishness to some and it offends others. This book, the gospel is offensive that a God would, would uh, stoop so low because the whole definition of God is that God is other than humanity. It's like out there in the, that God would stoop so low to take on humanity. Oh, and then, and then God would somehow lay down his life and uh, allow himself to be crucified. You know what? That was offensive to the Jews. They're like, whoa, that's just wrong. The Bible says that the gospel is foolishness to the Greeks because it was like, that's crazy stuff. This whole idea in here, you know, and the, the message that it was offensive to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, that wasn't just specifically talking about different, you know, people in a particular time period. It's talking about a way of thinking. And I'm telling you, this right here is offensive to some and this right here is foolishness to others. And as a Christian, the more that you say, I'm going to line my life up with this, the chances are things might get difficult for you. And this is why we have to make sure that we don't confuse circumstances around us with what was really at stake. And we don't start evaluating how things are going by just what's playing out in front of us, but that we have this deep-seated trust. We trust in God. We trust in God when things are awesome and we trust in God when things don't look that great. Because we believe that we believe that we believe that what Jesus said was true. And we know that we know that we know that we're not orphaned, but that we have the Holy Spirit. And we are absolutely convinced that our eternal future is secure and that the world does not win. Now I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to, we're going to sing a worship song and I want to just invite people to come down front. I, I, I want to invite you, if you feel prompted, there's no shame in coming down front and there's no shame in sitting in your seat. Okay, but if you are being quickened by, by, by the Lord that you just want to grow in your trust, you want to grow in your trust and you want to just pray, I want to open up the altars. I'm just saying, come on down. We're going to worship. Just come on down. Just, I want to grow in my trust. I want to grow in my trust. And we'll, we'll pray with you. If, if somebody, also I want to invite the altars to somebody. If you want to pray with people, if you are just full of faith in this category, like everybody doesn't have to get prayed by the pastor. I mean, I, I, I want to invite other people. If you feel a burden to pray for somebody, come pray for somebody. 
We're going to sing one worship song. Just enter into this moment and just all of us, wherever you're at, just say, I want to grow in my trust. Let's just press into God right now.